This is PNC Roundtable. Hello, this is Rick DeVore, Regional President for PNC Bank, and thank you for listening to PNC Roundtable. It's on this show that we tackle some of the region's tough issues with people who make a difference. Now here's the PNC Roundtable. Welcome in to the PNC Roundtable. I'm Paul W. Smith, usually with you Monday through Friday mornings at 5.30 to 9 on 760 on the AM dial. Uh, and, of course, our guest host uh, or co-host, if you will, is always Rick DeVore, Executive Vice President, Regional President, Detroit and Southeast Michigan, PNC Financial Services Group. And uh, I guess this would be the first chance to say to my co-host, uh, Happy New Year. Same to you, Paul W. It's good to be here as usual. Well, it's always nice to have you here, Rick. And it's nice to hear some of the great things that are happening. The mood has changed in Detroit and in Michigan. And it's a good, positive move. And there's more uh, good movement in the job markets, good movement in some uh, opportunities that are coming our way. It's its really, its I feel that I, I'm not jinxing it to say that we've changed directions. I would agree with you. I think it's a great time to be in Michigan, and I feel very lucky and fortunate to be back home. Um, I think with uh, some of the change that we're seeing um, in the euphoria with Rick Snyder coming into office, but also I think some good news on the jobs front, to your point. Until we produce jobs, I don't think we're going to see the kind of recovery we all hope and want for. And uh, we're seeing that in the lending market as well. So we're very excited about 2011 and what's going to be in store for this region. It's just across the board. In fact, for the first time, I'm hearing from a, uh, a few places, uh, and I know you have too, Rick, because you, you told me about this, about, again, to we haven't heard about people saying they have jobs and can't find enough people to fill those jobs. I mean, that is just fabulous. And that's something that we're going to touch in our conversation with Mike today on the program. And, you know, quite frankly, we're hearing from a number of our supplier companies um, this phenomena where they have openings they cannot fill. And I think it's about matching qualified applicants to the necessary jobs. We've had a number of people leave the region, either through they've left the region or they've retired or changed vocation. And I think um, it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that... You know, quite frankly, we have these jobs and we can't fill them. Um, so with that said, I think this auto recovery is really at the right pace. I think if it was too strong of a recovery, that problem would actually, uh, I think the big three would outpace the suppliers. Mm-hmm. And, and that brings us to the mic you refer to. Uh, we're very happy to have with us Mike Wall, who is the Senior Manager, Strategic Analysis at, Analysis at IHS Automotive. Now, Mike brings over 15 years of financial analysis, uh, consulting, and manufacturing experience to IHS Automotive. IHS is a, is a great, great company. Uh, I, I, I look forward to the emails I get from your company every week <laughs> filling me in on information that I'm able to use and to uh, uh, impart to my listeners. So it's uh, it really is uh, great to have you here in person, Mike. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Paul W. We are looking at uh, a positive outlook. Uh, Rick has touched on it. I've touched on it. Uh, let's get the official word now, the current outlook for vehicle sales and production, 2011, 2012. You're the expert. No, absolutely. We uh, it, it's a great uh, it's a great story. It's it's the recovery story we've been waiting for. You know, we 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 came through last year, which was the beginning of the recovery. Uh, you know, U.S. light vehicle sales. It looks like it came in around uh, uh, 11 11.6 million units last year. Um, this year, we're looking for about 13.1 million units. So again, a good sizable pace to this recovery. Not too fast, not, not to outstrip capacity or what's currently installed capacity. From a production standpoint, the suppliers, you know, and that's what drives, uh, you know, supplier performance is, you know, the, the parts they're making for uh, these vehicles. Uh, you know, production, we went all the way down in 2009 to 8.6 million units, uh, 4 million unit contraction. Uh, last year we came in, we probably came in around 11.9 million units. Well, this year we're looking at 12.9 million units. So another million unit increase. Uh, that's going to help these suppliers. It's going to help these automakers, you know, again, move through this recovery. More importantly, we're going to see this next year and we'll, we'll be talking, or next week, and we'll be talking about this, uh, the auto show. Now, all these new products that we're going to see uh, at the show is going to be another indication of just how far we've come uh, as an industry, you know, almost down to the automaker. It's, it's not any one particular automaker. All, all the automakers are doing some phenomenal work on uh, some, some really great new product, and we'll see that next week. Well, the quality now is just fabulous. 
And that means that our three, uh, primarily here in Detroit, uh, are benefiting as we keep ticking up in, in auto sales. They've gone through hell and back to, to be prepared to do whatever they have to do at a certain number. Every number above that means more profitability, more security in jobs, more possible growth. But everyone's going to be very careful, as you suggest, of course, Mike. Uh, but the, the quality now means that as the cars uh, tick up, we're getting a bigger and bigger percentage uh, of the business with the American-made automobiles. And that's really spectacular. And that's certainly good news, even though the suppliers are supplying people all over the world. It's very good news here in our own backyard. Oh, absolutely! It's a great story for for Michigan and uh, and Eastern Michigan. And, and you know, when you talk about quality, the, the thing that that we've talked about from time to time is the perception gap. You know, we know the the, the Detroit Three have improved quali- their quality and their products, but there's been that perception gap. Well, that gap is so rapidly closing, and I think last year was a big move to, towards closing that further, to the point where we saw in the in the paper today, Ford basically on par with Toyota on uh, Consumer even Reports. Even surpassing them. I, yeah, I, I, and, in, and, and in many products, definitely surpassing them. In sales, uh, yes. surpassing Toyota as well. And General Motors, what a, what a comeback story. But, you know, uh, interesting, and I thought of this as you were speaking, Mike uh, Wall is with us, Senior Manager, uh, Strategic Analysis, IHS Automotive, and, of course, our co-host, Rick DeVore, PNC. Um, it, it occurs to me that uh, as all of this is happening around us and these suppliers are starting to uh, do more business, uh, people are looking for more people to come to work. Uh, again, where do we, we have to, when I said it's a good thing that there are people out there who are saying to you, Rick, that, uh, you know, uh, I can't find enough people to, it's good that because there are jobs, but it's, there's a line that we pass and when they can't find enough good people, then that's a problem. I mean, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but the fact is, I wonder what we are doing. I know you guys are so involved in education and uh, and promoting right. that. That will go a long way in helping us. Yeah, it really will. Um, but your point and your concern, I think, is very well-founded because if we can't find those qualified workers in southeast Michigan or in Michigan, those jobs are going to go elsewhere. And I think, um, you know, if you really look at the buzz of the auto show right now, it is a barometer, I think, like was in the newspaper uh, today, the mood of Michigan. I think the auto show is the barometer of this region, whether people like to hear that or not. I no, think but it the really mood, is. The mood and, of Michigan is up, and there's no question that the mood of the auto industry is up. And we see that from your great analysis, Mike, at IHS Automotive. It's, you know, I don't want to get carried away, and I, and I, and I don't want to jinx anything, but it's really very promising. And, and what I think you're hearing from some of the suppliers, and Mike, I'd like you to chime in on this. I think you've heard this as well, is they're actually going on road trips, Paul W., to try to bring some of those folks either back to the region or to the region for the first time. And that's something I know that you care and this station cares immensely about is keeping our younger folks or attracting young people. And so I really think it's part of that issue that I think uh, the mayor's office as well as the governor's office is aware of, and that is how do we attract and maybe keep some of these people. But I know there's been, I've heard of road trips down to North Carolina, for instance, yeah. Mike. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, it, it's a great opportunity. We, we talk about and lament the brain drain, but with this recovery, we're in a huge opportunity, not at the not only at the automaker level, but at the supplier level. You hear about GM hiring thousands of people uh, either to work on their electrification pro- programs within the within the company or, or, or Chrysler looking to hire more engineers. Uh, there is going to be a critical opportunity for us as a region to go out and try to recapture that that talent and bring them back to the market because right now we're on the cusp of this recovery and and it's progressing along nicely uh, but frankly I, I think we've got more good things ahead of us as it relates to auto and and I think that can definitely positively impact this region and you know uh, we did lose a lot of kids but a lot of those kids would happily come back home absolutely if there were jobs available right and now we're hearing that there are jobs available, and we need those kids to come back home. We'd like our children to get a, a first crack at those jobs to be able to come back home, and, and we're hoping that that's a possibility. Through all of the bad times, and, and Mike, you would know this and you can help us understand, but through all of the bad times, the collapse in the industry, et cetera, et cetera, did we lose as many suppliers as expected, or, or 
in the end, not really. Yeah. You know, in my experience, and in, 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 in what we've seen as we've talked to suppliers, we ha- we didn't. And, and, and why didn't we, we lose We didn't as lose many? as many. We didn't. Right. And okay. We didn't seem to. And, and there are a few reasons for that. One, uh, when, we, when we went through this incredibly cathartic process, uh, the automakers were resourcing business, other suppliers, because they needed to keep the lines running. Uh, so some of those suppliers that were finding their plants starting to slow down were able to backfill with some of that new business, that resource business. But more importantly, the supply, what the suppliers did is they cut. They cut deep. And, and it hurt. Uh, but they, had, they did everything they could do to stay alive to the point where we had the owners of these companies on the line working right next, next to the other line workers just to keep the business operating. And you, you can never underestimate, particularly on the smaller, even some of these mid-sized suppliers, you can never underestimate the will to keep a business, whether it be a family business or a business that's been around for decades, uh, keep it alive. We, we now, of hindsight being so good, we heard of stocks that were down to thirty-eight cents a share, yeah. that are fifteen or twenty dollars a share now. Absolutely. And those suppliers hung in there. They uh, and 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 it's just a phenomenal story. Here's the other story I want you to tell us about, though, if you would. There there have been problems along the way uh, between the OEMs and the suppliers. The relationships were tough. It, it was always tough. I, I have friends, uh, suppliers, who years gone by, I'd say, hey, I understand things are going well. And they go, shh, shh, don't, don't say anything. I mean, because literally, if the people that were supplying found out they were actually profitable and healthy, they'd say, you're charging us too much. You gotta, you're, you're, you're making money. Which, of course, finally people have figured out that if the company doesn't make money, they're not going to be around and you won't have the supplies that you need. But has that relationship, since we shared this this experience, has the relationship improved? It has. I, I think it has. I mean, I think what we saw going through this process and what the, I think the automakers saw was, you know, the old way of doing some of that business, it may have paid some near, very near-term benefits, you know, saving a nickel on a part or, you know, a dime, whatever. Uh, but the longer-term fundamentals, yeah, do you really want to be worrying about whether your supplier is going to fall, fall down every day or you know, go under? And, you know, let's make it more of a true collaboration. And it's, it's somewhat trite, but it's true. When a supplier comes out with their latest innovation, you want them to come to you with that innovation. You don't want them to go down the down the street to the next guy. So it, it behooves both sides. Now, right now, we've gone through this lull where, you know, frankly, the, the relationships have gotten a lot better and, and the suppliers are getting to the point where they're making some considerable sums of money. So are the automakers. So I think there's this sense that, well, we're kind of waiting for that, that knock on the door to come back in terms of maybe giving, giving some money back or, you know, trying to, a little more pressure on pricing. I think some of that pressure will come, but I, uh, my hope is, and I think this will be the case, it'll be more collaborative. So, you know, if you can cut, uh, cut the costs on this part, maybe we share in the cost, cost cut. Let's work together. You know, so but, like a paradigm shift, I think, is what you're yeah, asking. And I yeah. think our view is the same because I think the percentage that is now outsourced compared to, say, 20 years ago is much greater. And I think people have looked at models, whether we're talking like McDonald's, where, you know, McDonald's definitely wants their suppliers to stay viable and stay in business. Now, they don't want to be taken advantage of either, but I think to Mike's point, I think now that there's been a higher percentage of parts done outside of, you know, the confines of the big three, there's more reliance on them, and I think there's a paradigm shift. Now, I realize there's naysayers out there that say, well, let's see how that long that lasts. Is that here to stay? And I think we all want to see it here to stay, but I, I do think when we feel that there has been somewhat of a shift Definitely. in that philosophy. In every business, uh, there will be pressures, and people will be looking for the best price they can get. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and unfortunately, sooner or later, there'll be people out there who are willing to sell things at a loss just to get their foot in the door. That came to a grinding halt right. Uh, right. for a lot of reasons because that did cost some companies their their lives. Uh, so I, I do hope you guys are right that we have seen that people understand that people doing business and especially the people we want to do business with have to be healthy also. Absolutely. And when we uh, tier our suppliers and we you know have fifty five thousand employees, so we do a lot of buying ourselves. We tier them uh, in terms of how critical that supplier is. And obviously somebody supplying flowers in the lobby is not the same kind of tier as somebody running your central computer system. We want that central computer system supplier to be viable. 
And I don't think that's different than in no. the auto industry. No. It's just been uh, more f- front of mind uh, because we're Detroit, Michigan. We're the Motor City <laughs> capital. We're Motown. We're all of that. And uh, as the outlook for the Detroit 3 improves, the image of the Detroit 3 improves, as we've been talking about, m- the perception gap is, is narrowing. People are finally figuring out we really are making the best cars in the world. Uh, all of that aside, there are things that can affect us that are beyond my uh, ability to fully understand, and that's why I'm glad I've got Rick DeVore, uh, Executive uh, Vice President, Regional President, Detroit and Southeast Michigan PNC Financial Services Group as co-host of this program, and our guest, Mike Wall, Senior Manager, Strategic Analysis, IHS Automotive, to help me understand the sovereign debt issues of select European countries. And no matter how well we do, and we're doing well, and mm-hmm. we are growing and going to do better but no matter how well we do with our detroit three let's call them there will be an impact on the north american automotive market from these european countries and their their debt issues too help me understand that a little better yeah we're very much even though we're so vested in the auto industry here in michigan and 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 in detroit but we're so much we're a global industry and 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 the ramifications can certainly breach uh Breach borders and breach oceans. So what we what we see, you know, certainly what's going on in, in Europe with the sovereign debt, it seems to change. It evolves, you know, over the weeks. And one week it's going to be a catastrophe. And another week, well, we're managing through it. But what what we've seen at least thus far, you know, some of our automakers that are building here in North America, maybe like BMW and Daimler, uh, and exporting vehicles back to Europe, they're going to have some, I think, be be impacted somewhat because they may not have as much of an export market to Europe because all the austerity measures that are either planned or ongoing could impact those vehicle sales over there. From a credit perspective, and I'd even I'd, I'd love to get maybe Rick's insight on that. From a credit perspective, we haven't really seen a, a major spillover into North America yet, uh, with all of the uh, with all of the either possible defaults or the bailouts that are going on over in Europe. But uh, you know, it's something that we are watching very closely, and we're trying to trying to monitor and be mindful of but it is definitely it's because it is a global industry there are definitely impacts so so tell us rick what do you think well and i, I think um you know there gets a lot of fanfare let's take greece for example i mean greece gets a lot of fanfare but in the scheme of things greece is pretty small in the relative uh, size of the auto buying market in addition to that what what is europe buying and t- getting back to the bmw example um you know, if you look at what some of the big three are producing abroad and the price point that they're, like what's going on in Turkey, for example, and what, what Ford is producing, it's a different price point. It's not really at the luxury end. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, you know, our feel is that some of the sovereign debt issues may not, it depends on what you're producing in those countries. Um, but for all the fanfare, and I'm not here to, uh, you know, uh, make light of Greece. Right. It is a, it's or not Ireland, the for, yeah. for that matter. Yeah. You know, that now, used if you're to talking be... Germany or France, that's a different situation, obviously, much mm-hmm. different. But if you look at Portugal, you know, the you know Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain, seems to be a lot of fanfare about those four. You know, obviously, we're much more concerned about, you know, this relative size of the ability to move the market in Italy and Spain than we would, you know, obviously in Greece. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm not trying to pick on... Uh, Greece, but it's just not a needle mover. You want to give your email address so people can (laughs) uh, respond to you and not me? (laughs) Well, but I'm glad that you put that into perspective, and and it would take you to do that, because you're you're out there in the currency markets. You're out there uh, in in an area that most of us aren't participating in, but are affected by. I don't know, Mike, if you, uh, you know, in terms of what's being produced abroad, but I know that, uh, for instance, Ford has... Mm -hmm. uh, done well in, in Turkey, for example, yes. but I think some of the product they're producing, or in India, mm-hmm. is much different um, than maybe what Daimler and BMW are Definitely, selling. definitely. W- what would you say then, Mike, would be the, the key areas of opportunity right now and in, in going forward uh, for the automakers and the suppliers? Well, I mean, that's a, that is the big question that they're all wrestling with right now. I mean, when we look at in North America, or in the U.S. in particular, we've got these cafe requirements that are coming in around 2016 higher fuel efficiency i can't and say that sentence without saying the impossible cafe requirements but you go ahead and, you're the professional here <laughs> it's going to be a challenge there's no question and, and and that's the challenge facing both suppliers and automakers alike so when, when we're talking about opportunities for suppliers it's going to be light weighting their parts we got to pull some weight out of these vehicles 
Uh, we're Which going then, to address, then there are safety issues to be concerned Absolutely. about. I mean, there's unintended consequences that run amok there's, there's at a time impacts. like this when the government steps up and says, huh, we don't know anything about cars, but you know what? We're going to make a determination. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk to some scientists and some engineers maybe first? Uh, but uh, be that as it may, the views expressed by Mr. Smith are those of Mr. Smith, not of Mr. Rick DeVore, Mike Wall, or their companies. <laughs> but building on that, though, we, we are seeing on uh, the footprint of some of these vehicles will be shrinking. And and I think that does fit in st still with the demographic shifting that's going on even in the in the U.S. market. So you're going to see vehicles becoming slightly smaller, you, but you will not lose the content. You're not going to go back to these old, you know, Spartan vehicles of, of yesteryear. Uh, they will be better contented. Sure. And, uh, I've said all along that the, the problem with smaller cars in America, it always meant it was a cheap, small car that right. didn't have anything on it. And, and I always felt, uh, other than the Cimarron, if you had a small, loaded vehicle with all the things that we love, yes. we would be more happy to be in that car. Absolutely. Check it out next week because you'll see the Fiesta over there. You'll, the Ford Fiesta, the, the Chevy Sonic, um, the Ford Focus. I mean, these are vehicles, the Chevy Cruze, that are uh, traditionally smaller vehicles, compact, subcompact vehicles with leather and navigation systems. You know, these are vehicles that you could see in Europe, um, and they're very popular. They, and they're they fun to out. drive. They and were fun to drive. Oh, they're they're, to they're drive. really uh, good vehicles that we weren't doing here, but now we must uh, for a variety of and reasons. And how about 40 miles per gallon? And, 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 and how about $4 a gallon <laughs> gas? And, absolutely. you know, all of that stuff in, in, uh, inevitably is going to be coming our way, uh, no there's no question about that. But uh, now, just so you're not confused as you listen to WJR.com, and, and I shouldn't have to explain this to you, but I will. Uh, depending on when you're listening to our program, uh, when uh, Mike or Rick or I refer to the auto show coming up next week, it might be on this week, or it might have ended last <laughs> week. Uh, so uh, you, you know when the, when the auto show is. And we hope that you're coming. We hope you're enjoying it. And we hope you went and had a good time. <laughs> And there we covered it all for, for whenever you might <laughs> be great listening point. online with this. Uh, you talk to these guys. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, Mike. You, you have to help them analyze and, and figure out uh, what do the auto guys say about those cafe uh, requirements. I mean, candidly, they must say a little something to you. You know, when we're, we're talking or I'm talking to the automakers or even the suppliers, on the, see, on the supplier end, I'll, I'll first point out, as much as we may lament government regulations and things like that, that creates opportunity for suppliers. And, you know, whether you're talking, you know, seat belts and airbags and uh, all of that has cr opened up significant new markets and up opportunity for suppliers. So a company like Borg Warner and with some of the, the powertrain technologies that they're, they're executing um, are, are, are very strong and, and can go a long way to helping the automakers hit these cafe requirements. But with that said, it is a challenge. There's no question. It's not. We're very much a, a large car, pickup truck, and full-frame truck-based uh, market, much more so than any other market in the world. So changing, you can't change on a dime. So it's, it's going to take, each one of these automakers is really going through and trying to figure out which, which technology will be best. They've got kind of a toolbox. So in some, in some ways, it's going to be direct injection. In others, they're going to use turbocharging and supercharging. Uh, they're going to shrink the footprint of these cars. Um, it's not a given. <laughs> it's not, this isn't a gimme by any stretch. It's, it's going to be a challenge. And, and in fact, we as consumers, I think, are going to have to change our mindset because there may not be that uh, those raft of very large vehicles uh, available. The availability of some of these vehicles will be will be challenging because the automakers are, you know, are are need to build certain vehicles in order to fall within government regs. Well, you know, uh, the the uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee uh, Overland I was given to drive uh, for a few days by uh, the the Chrysler Jeep Superstores, a, a magnificent vehicle. I have not yet driven the new Ford Explorer. I want to. Mm -hmm. But let's be honest. A lot of people during the good days were buying these off-road vehicles and not ever Never. went off-road. I mean, sometimes they might have had to pull into a gravel driveway. <laughs> but I'm, we had capability that we didn't need, that we paid for, and that cost a lot of extra gas. Yes. So I understand 
at least in the Ford Explorer's case, that they've said, okay, you know, the, the people are not going to buy this necessarily to go off-road. Let's be realistic with what we're doing. You happened to mention pickup trucks the other day. My goodness. I know the F-150 was, or maybe still is, the most popular, uh, most sold vehicle ever. But I was, st- I was standing to what had to be a brand new, I'm going to think it was like an F-250. It was a monster pickup truck. A monster. And then I sit here and think, people say, oh, the pickup truck is dead. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> if you need it, you need it. I think people won't be just buying those just for fun like they might have in the past. You're, you're absolutely right. That, that casual buyer, that sort of weekend warrior. I'd like to have a pickup truck. That's right. Why? But if they want it, they want it. In the past, maybe they'll still do it, but you don't need that capacity. Right. And with gas broaching $3 and, you know, do you want to spend $100 a week filling up your tank if you're not really using it for that purpose? So what we see as a, you know, it's very much the dedicated user. It's the people that are towing, hauling, using it for work. They're contractors. And there is a market for it. The, the, the pickup truck market is not dying. It's not dead. It's evolving. And, and it has evolved. It's a market that the automakers, the Detroit 3, have 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 turned it into an art form. I mean, they're the export experts at making pickup trucks. Um, you know, Toyota makes a, a very compelling offering. Nissan has a, a very solid offering. But the Detroit 3 have done a phenomenal job over the de- over decades mm-hmm. building these pickup trucks. And there is a market for it. Uh, you know, we're faced with a, a terrible housing market, no question. And we've gone through such a such a uh, really a downturn on that from that front. That we got, it. we still need some recovery on the on the housing market to really start fueling some of that pickup truck growth. But with that said, we are we we have seen some stabilization and even some growth in in certain uh, parts of the pickup truck market. Well, Mike brings that up. So Rick Devore, you're our expert in that area. Tell us a little bit about the housing market and what you're seeing there at PNC. Well, we're seeing seeing a recovery. It hasn't really um, been felt and probably will not be felt in 2011 in the state of Michigan in terms of what we're seeing elsewhere regionally and nationally um, so this recovery that is spoken of is uneven like a lot of things um, it is uneven and still in the southwest California in Florida and Michigan is in that group as well um, but we you're seeing some stabilization but not to uh, where we'd like it to like it to be and to Mike's point a lot runs off the housing sector if you look at the brand loyalty of pickup trucks it's phenomenal how many times people stay with their brand um, but we also think, though, that some of these vehicles are wearing out, and so they're going to have to replace them. You know, it's um, funny you say about brand loyalty. Uh, I don't see it on a Mercedes. I don't see it on a, on a Lincoln or a Cadillac. Uh, I don't see it on a BMW. But on pickup trucks, it's not unusual to see a little decal in the back window of, of how the person really feels about another maker of right. pickup trucks. I don't want to get any more graphic or specific, but I think you all know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) But so, you know, to sum it up on the housing front, um, I think 2011, uh, Michigan will not enjoy the same pace of recovery that other parts of the United States will, but it will be better. Is, is a one way to look at it, but also it's that, a good it's, way to look at it's it. It's not just housing, though. Uh, the people. It's yeah. also commercial construction as well. And you and I both know that this town does not have a lot of cranes. Uh, it's pretty hard. You're hard-pressed to find a construction project in this town. No, but uh, the last town I was in that uh, had a whole bunch of cranes was Dubai. And I said, you know what? <laughs> They're really going to be in trouble. Absolutely. You know, we might have a few problems in Detroit, but when, uh, we, we fall off our chair and hit the ground. They were falling off 50-story buildings and hitting the ground. We, there's so many cranes. Wow. And the other place, the last place I saw a lot of cranes also was Las Vegas. And boy, did they have yeah. problems. So right. measured comeback and growth for our area is what we're hoping for. And and it won't happen soon enough for people who have to sell their house now or, or even lose their house, mm-hmm. how sad that is. But uh, uh, but it is going to come back and come back in a measured way. I think uh, the I would offer to you it's similar to the recovery in the auto sector. It's going to be slower than some people want, but it is recovering. Is, is, a, is a way yeah. that we look at it. That is, a, uh, that is good news, and that's from the banking side of it or the financial services side of it. And I think uh, on the uh, strategic analysis side of it from IHS Automotive, I, I would hope you would agree, Mike. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I hate for you to pick favorites, uh, but but if you would, at least from this standpoint, which, which automakers, back to the autos, because of all of the attention for the start of the year and the 
North American International Auto Show and all the other good things happening. Which automakers, in, in your opinion and your research, are, are doing a good job uh, in terms of their product introductions and capturing consumer interest and market share and all of that? Absolutely. This is part of the good, uh, I think, the good news story for, for Detroit and Michigan because when you look at what Ford's done, I mean, it's been nothing short of, a, I think, a miracle uh, in terms of that turnaround. If you look back in 2006 when, when they were obviously really struggling and we brought on, uh, they brought Alan Mulally on board and the turnaround was, was starting. It was kind of in place, but he, he really did uh, focus that company. And what we've seen with some of those product launches, the, the Ford Fusion, the, the Ford Fiesta, the new Ford Explorer that you talked about, just some significant new product coming out for, for Ford, and they've actually captured market share last year. Uh, General Motors has some great new product out. And yeah, what I a, just what saw that. Uh, I just started to see that. It's a pretty uh, head-turning, eye-opening stuff that, that, frankly, was a big surprise so quickly at GM. Absolutely. You look at the Chevy Equinox and the, even the Chevy Cruze that they hear, launched here uh, fairly recently. I mean, some, some really compelling new product. And, and it's, it's not just with the Detroit 3 either. Uh, you look at Hyundai, for example. Hyundai has been, what a story with, with Hyundai. You know, the Sonata and the Santa Fe, and and you've got the Elantra they're launching right now, and they captured market share last year. So there are definitely some new new products coming out. Chrysler is going to be very ever-present at the show with some freshened product and new product. These are all compelling people, all in their own way. You mentioned Alan Mullally, Mr. Ackerson over there, the newest guy on the block uh, to the industry and to our, specifically to GM. but this Sergio Marchione is, uh, you know, he's, he, I really think he's kind of the sleeper in the group. He doesn't participate in a lot of the, the kinds of conversations and talk that some of these people have or had to in the past. He kind of shows up in his sweater, cigarette dangling when he can get away with it, and he says very few words that are very direct and uh, you don't have to read into them because mm-hmm. he says what he says and he means what he means and that's it. And I just believe that the people who are really close to him really, really think he's the guy that's going to make some big uh, differences here with Chrysler. And so they're quietly there, but mm-hmm. I think they're really there and some big things are going to happen. Now, that's my uh, that's my take on it. I, you were about to give yours. No, I would definitely agree. I mean, what... Uh, <laughs> I think we all owe him a, a, a debt of gratitude. Seeing him come in, I was I was skeptical myself. You know, it, to, how can somebody run two businesses, on two different continents, and and one that's clearly in, needs to be in a turnaround mode? Uh, the work he's got a phenomenal work ethic. I mean, it's just uh, almost inhuman. Uh, but what he's done to both bring the all of the the positive attributes and, and the the assets of Fiat and bring them into Chrysler and and then get that team really working effectively uh, was huge. It was just a, it was a, it was a massive undertaking, and I and I think he's largely delivered on on those promises. I mean, if you I don't think anybody would have believed necessarily you know, 12 18 months ago. If we would have told them where they're standing now, you know, would, sure. would have believed that story. But he's he's done it. Well, and and the guy that came to my mind actually, Mike Wall, when you were saying that was Carlos Goen, uh, because here's a guy also who was running uh, at least two companies in two different parts of the world, who also was on an airplane all the time, and also was, and I think still is, a superstar in the industry. You couldn't pick two more different yeah. personalities, uh, and maybe styles, than from Carlos and Sergio. But, uh, by the way, what do you hear lately from uh, Carlos and, and what he's trying to do? Well, you know, he's got, he's got an interesting path there. He's chosen for both Renault and Nissan. You know, the Leaf is the big splash, obviously the big PR coup right now with, on the electric vehicle front. Uh, but we've got both Renault on, over in Europe and then, of course, Nissan, which is a solid presence here in North America, but, of course, in, in Asia. I mean, he's executing a- along his path as well, really focusing on electrification and, and, and the, the alternative uh, fuel powertrains, I guess, if you will. That's been somewhat of a, a departure 
over maybe the last couple of years, but they're all in on that. And and I think that's a great thing. I mean, in terms of the technology, we talk a little bit about, you know, how we're going to hit certain benchmarks and so forth. And where are the opportunities? Technology is the opportunity. I mean, who would have thought the auto industry? And we've got Malali speaking at the Consumer Electronics Show again. Twice in a row or three yeah, times three in a times row times or whatever. whatever. Now. Yeah. And uh, Automotive has become sort of a technology leader in well, they, many ways. They, they, we've known that for a while. They, well, yeah. The rest of the world is just starting to figure it out. Absolutely, and it's when we see these, uh, you know, the electric vehicles, the the Leaf, the Volt, some of these other, uh, all these new technology, my Ford Touch, and the Sync technology, working with Microsoft. I mean, what what your car can do for you and with you on a daily basis is phenomenal. It's uh, it's one of those things that you know automakers have to stay at the forefront on that. It creates a significant amount of opportunity for suppliers and also the automakers. Uh, and it's the consumer will win in the end. I think uh, when we see this. Uh, with all the proliferation of new product. Yeah, I think it's, you're right. Rick, we still seem to be a gadget society, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, when absolutely. I, uh, the new owners of Focuses, I talk to them, and now they want to talk about the sink. <laughs> I'm not sure they have a clue uh, what size engine's in there, and it's <laughs> okay, but, but they love the technology, and uh, it, it's and it's gotten, at least in Ford's case with the Fusion, a, a lot of great Definitely. press. Yeah. And, uh, and you know what it's doing, too? Um, and this goes back to a conversation, in fact, I had with Carlos Goen many years ago, um, these are not washing machines or dryers or uh, other appliances. These are cars. And there was a point in time when they became like washing machines and dryers. And, you know, <laughs> that's not what an automobile is. We became, in this area, passionate about our vehicles and our cars. And we're getting back to the passion. It's interesting that you point this out because... The passion might be geared toward the things inside the automobile more so than ever, like sync, as opposed to knowing what that engine and the displacement is and all of that. I don't care what it is. It's just good to see people getting back Definitely. to passion. The only other problem, I think, is that when we went to a leasing society, um, you know, when you look at the cars that people love, like in the Dream Cruise, there isn't one car that's in that Dream Cruise that somebody used to lease or was a leased car. <laughs> These were cars they bought they babied, they loved, they took care of. And when you make them kind of, you know, throw away expendable, that was that was a tough time. It, it's still there, but put all the goodies on there, and people are loving those vehicles. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Absolutely. Why don't you close it out for us here, uh, Mr. DeVore, and uh, any other thoughts or comments that we need uh, in this uh, roundtable? It's been certainly helpful to have Mike Wall here for this Automotive Industry Outlook for 2011, that's for sure. Well, we wanted to have this session. We've have a long relationship with Mike's firm and with Mike personally. And we just, uh, you know, we thought it was a great topic, timely, obviously, with the North American Auto Show. And I want to reiterate the fact that so starts the new year, this region goes with the auto show, and it is a barometer of this region and the state. And so, um, you know, we're very, very positive about what is in store for this region in 2011. And so we just thought this show would really make a lot of sense. There's been some misconception about our commitment to this space. And I would like to clarify that. I mean, we have well over $2 billion of exposure to auto suppliers and about $5.6 billion to the auto sector. And um, so for us, it's a chance to kind of remove some of the mystery around that. We are a player in the space. We understand the space. We buy research, just like a lot of folks do from Mike's firm. And we use that to make uh, good decisions. And so we're committed to this space and excited about the prospects for 2011. Well, we're uh, we're excited about it too, and we're happy to be able to bring these uh, these programs and our PNC roundtable, thanks to you, to our WJR listeners who are smart enough to be going online and finding this program whenever they need it and whenever they want it. And we do thank uh, Mike Wall, Senior Manager, Strategic Analysis at IHS Automotive, and of course. Rick DeVore, our co-host, Executive Vice President, Regional President, Detroit and Southeast Michigan, PNC Financial Services Group, Incorporated. Meanwhile, we'll see you next time on the PNC Roundtable. Regards, Paul W. Smith.